Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming out. All right. So, you know, so we're going to take a look. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Peter Slosser here. Uh, and he always has the best shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and bow ties. And bow ties. Known for his beard. So I'm just going to shave it off. You know, so he's always in, in cute bow ties. So Peter does a lot of work. He's kind of started off as a composer and is kind of done a, a lot of work in some serious video games, including Destiny, which is kind of a huge project. And if you're not familiar, you know, how many people play Destiny? All right, so it's, yeah, very enthusiastic. It's kind of interesting, you know, because now with our new endo, we've been kind of getting into a lot of game realms and you realize how the budgets for games are like so much bigger than films and albums and different projects, music projects. So, you know, we're doing a lot of work with that, and it's probably one of the few things where you could actually have a full orchestra uh, be involved with that. So Peter's going to share some of his techniques in using Cubase uh, and how he was able to get these projects done, which are always, you know, the deadlines never get longer, I assume, no. um, and the budgets never get cut, and there's no demand. So, uh, so we'll have Peter explain how he kind of goes through the process. Everyone give a warm welcome to Peter. Thank you. Um, so if, if there's anything that I'm missing or that you want to hear, let me know. If you guys want to hear something specific also, let me know. Um, I, I might stumble a little bit only because I don't have my key commands in this machine. Um, but so the, the, the Twitter version of how I got to work on Destiny 2 is, so I'm, I'm uh, part of a team of four guys. Um, so I'm, I'm good friends with Sky Lewin, who is the... He's, he runs the music department at, at Bungie, along with Mike Salvatore, who's the OG music guy from Bungie. He worked on all the Halo games, and you know he's OG Mike. Um, so I'm, 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 I went to college with, uh, with Sky at Berkeley in Boston, and so we sort of grew up together in the audio world. And about two and a half years ago, he called me, and he said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. What you got? He said, oh, we have this game. And so I, it, it, was, it was a really natural transition because he... We have, you know, the same pedigree, if you will, um, and he's, he knows what I've done. You know, I worked a bit on some of the Transformers movies and Gears of War 2 and 3, and so he knows that I can do some of the hybrid orchestral stuff, which is what they wanted. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit of nepotism also. Um, but it was, it was the ease and the, sh and the shorthand of, of him saying, listen, we have, these, we have this project. We've been working on, on these tunes because they, they're on site in Seattle. And they had written these melodies for these, uh, for these characters, and they said, well, this is what we need. Um, call me when you're done, essentially. And what's interesting about the video game stuff is that there's so much technology baked into the music. So it's not just, oh, you know, I know about Scriabin and Mozart and Beethoven. It's I know how to use the tools that will allow me to spit the stuff out that they need in the end. And um, Cubase has been really instrumental in that um, if you will. So I'll show you my session here. I, I hardly ever use the split screen, um, interestingly. So, but this is, this is sort of a typical writing session. Um, let me see, is this enabled now? So this is, uh, sorry, this is me stumbling because I don't have my key commands. But there's th this. This is typically what 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 it looks like. Uh, let me get rid of the lower section. These are all muted only because there's no MIDI connected to it. But at least you get to see how it's laid out. And this is over, you know over years of me trying to build a template that would make sense. Um, so it's a bit half of what I took from working at Remote Control when I used to work for Steve Jablonski, and then merging my own things into it. Um, I have the, the divide track list up here with the different sections with these big markers. So I have three marker tracks, the master marker, section markers, and then there's the album edits marker, which is you know basically a, a cut down version of this entire thing that they choose which one goes on the soundtrack album. Uh, there's a core track that I use often, which is really easy for me to just kind of have an overview of what the chords are. So I'll, you know I'll, I'll play in something that might be very pianistic in, in sort of a string patch, and I'll show you all my instruments after. And then 
and then I just go, you know, figure out the chords. I mean, I know what they are, but it's a lot easier to say, yeah, just, you know, select the chords, figure out what they are, and just show them to me up there. So this makes it a lot easier for me to go, oh, okay, these are the notes that I need to play in. And then I, I fan out the entire thing, and I orchestrate it according to, to that. And it's a lot easier to, you know, click on these chords and be able to audition them with, with the piano sound and go, oh, yeah, maybe this doesn't work. Let's try something else. Um, signature track, which is right now empty because this one's just a regular 4-4 thing, but it's obviously handy to have a very visual, you know, quick and visual thing. Um, below is the, is what ends up in, oh, sorry, hang on one second. Let me zoom out. So these are the album edits over here, which are muted. I can, I can mute those. And this is what ended up being the, the MIDI mock-up. Um, what's nice is that we are able to record, um, so we've been going to Nashville to record there. So a lot of this stuff is, you know, so I, I clean out a lot of the things that if the orchestrator doesn't need to see it, it goes away. So anything that's orchestral, so I'll, I'll go through it. This is, you know, super quick. So this is my, my master, uh, master folder, which has everything in it. If I need to um, edit things down, this makes it so much easier. So the folder thing, I've been working on another, pro another project with a, with a colleague of mine, and he said, hey, can we use this other DAW that might, you know, the name rhymes with uh, Psychologic? <laughs> um, so he asked me to use that, and I begrudgingly said yes. So we've been using that. Um, it, this whole folder thing makes all the difference. The whole stack thing and logic that, no. This folder thing is beautiful. It's, it's so... The, the, the Germanic aspect of the organization is great. So anyway, so here I have my, you know, all my percussion stuff. All this stuff is audio. So whether it's, um, you know, loops or stuff that I sample in myself or anything that's custom that they might send me where they said, oh, we've been using this on this project, so can you use that? All of that goes here. Um, there's some other synthy elements that are also audio. And then once you get down here, this is all, all MIDI stuff. So it, it starts out with the percussion only because that's sort of how I, how I got used to working when I was at remote control. Um, you know, all, all kinds of different percussion because you can never have enough of that, especially for big orchestral uh, hybrid stuff. And then it, within the master folder, there's the melodic folder, which for video games, well, for anything really, but if you're working in TV, this makes conforming so much easier because I can just, it's so much faster doing it this way. And I can transpose stuff really easily too, which is nice. So if I have a melodic folder that's separated from the percussion, I can go into the melodic, only see the melodic, select a section and just move up and down and it's transposed and that's done, you know. So it's also very, very quick. Um, since all kinds of different things, whether it's pads or moving things or arpeggiating things, um, I try not to use too many instruments. I, I, I've gotten really used to the whole um, the rack thing, um, sort of from the old older days of Cubase, and and it's nice because I can I can have one instance of Halion or Contact, and then just have my MIDI stuff. I, I you know it, it it for me it makes things a bit easier. Then you go down here to the orchestra, and this is all laid out sort of as you, as it would be in a, in a proper score where you have woodwinds, brass. Um, strings and within these sections I have ensemble patches that I usually play in and then I try to move away from being too pianistic and then I go into each individual articulation and I try to orchestrate it as as one one would um, and I'm a woodwind player I play saxophone which you'll never find in any of, any of this stuff but what what's nice about being a sax player or a woodwind player is that you're not writing you know 32 bars of brass at fortissimo and and you don't think you know these guys actually have to breathe right so so the phrasing becomes a bit more natural that way um because i think oh, okay so these guys have to breathe now and 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 also thinking about um the fact that there are there's humans that are going to be performing this especially on the brass side where if you're playing for four hours you're gonna, you're gonna get tired very fast right their lips are gonna go go very quickly especially for something that's really bombastic and, and, and as large as this. Strings, similar thing. Ensemble that then gets you know, split out into the different sections. And what I like about this is that it, it forces me to think um, 
a, a bit more orchestrally in the sense that, you know, I'm not going to write 10 voices on the strings. It's mm, four voices, maybe five, you know, that I can, I could maybe cheat out, but it, it, it makes for a more natural writing that way where you have, where you think of the sections and each section is, you know, maybe one, one voice, maybe you have an extra voice. Um, now, as far as the delivery, this stuff up here makes it really easy, the cycle markers, because, let me zoom in here. So the cycle markers allow me to export stuff very quickly and easily. Um, so everything is routed. I'm going to go to the mixer. What's the shortcut for the mixer? The normal one. Thank you. Where's the F keys? Thank you. I promise I do this professionally. <laughs> <laughs> so um, all of my stuff is all pre-routed. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really kind of a, a nerd when it comes to workflow. So I have an iPad with a bunch of different, I have faders and I have keyboard shortcuts and, and then I go, ooh, if I do this one thing and I do use the macros, I can press one button and it does all these things, right? So it's kind of nice to detach from the creator brain and, and go to the, uh, the, uh, the engineering brain and the nerd brain to, to do that sort of a thing. Um, and one of the, you know, my major in Berkeley was actually engineering, so producing the heck out of the demos is sort of the most fun for me. So you're, you're producing as you're, as you're writing. Um, so these are all the different things that I, the stems that I deliver, all these, these groups. So everything's all pre-routed so that in the end, when I'm done writing, I could just go click and then everything spit out in, into all the stems and I can just upload it to their servers. And is that done with the macro? Mm -hmm. um, that that one actually is is not because the uh, audio export window is so you know so practical and, and, and easy right so um, let's see file export I mean you guys have audio okay, mixed down so you know do that and then between cycle markers and because the naming is is adopted from the cycle markers then everything is you know named woods this is the section this is the title this is the version. It's so easy, and it's so much easier than in any other program that I've used. It's great. It's, I mean, so thank you guys for that. Um, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me close that. Um, what, what, what else can I, I mean, I, I love, I'd love it if there were some questions, because rather than speaking at you, I'd like to speak with you. Yes. So the section markers is you, you know, purely st uh, stemming out all those instruments underneath that exact chunk. Right, and it's all, it also gives me sort of a visual thing. You know, because these things are, are, are modular and you can, you can, you know, games are, are they've come a long way since, since I worked on, for example, Gears of War 3, which was the last you know, bigger game that I, that I worked on with, with Steve, um, where you would just say, oh, here's, you know, maybe a couple of stems. And now, and I, I, I don't know any of the integration. That's all done by them because they're much smarter than me. But you deliver these things, and somehow the console decides, oh, well, this is happening, so I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to grab this piece of music. And that's all you know, super easy and, and e easily done with, with this. And it also keeps, keeps me, you know, I, I kind of know where I am. So I, I can't do you know, 16 bars or 32 bars of the same thing that just kind of grows. You know, I can't do the Zimmer thing that he does so well. I have to do, okay, well, I'm doing eight bars of this. Now where do I go? I have to go somewhere completely different so that it keeps it interesting for the player. Because you can be in a, in a level forever, right? And kind of putzing around. So it, it was an interesting muscle for me to flex on this project because, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of TV where it's 20 seconds of music or 30 or maybe 10. But with this, you're writing these long cues and you have to find a way to keep it interesting for the player. So I'm hoping that if it's interesting for me as I'm writing it, it'll also be that way for, for the player. Any other questions as we yeah so when you write the section bits do you actually write them in a way so that you can interconnect them in that's the idea yeah 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 so the idea would be that I you know you can you can connect these different sections um, seamlessly um, as as the game but again that's all sort of beyond my understanding of how how the integration happens but that's the uh, the idea is to grab these different sections and being able to put them up against each other without any Inter interruption in the music. Can we hear what you got? Yeah, um, I can show you. Uh, let's see. I don't know. I'll show you some of the action action bits. This is all connected, yeah. Yes. And there's a volume knob somewhere so that we don't. 
Okay. That's, that's part of the demo that, that we did, and this is then the final. Um, it, won't, it, won't, it won't be exactly the same section, but because this is one of the album edits, but at least you get the idea of, of we mix in some of the, the percussion and all that it is, is all in the box. The orchestra is mostly live. Sometimes I will put in some, some fake stuff, but it's mostly, mostly uh, real, real players, which makes all the difference. Something that's a bit uh, less less obnoxious. Let's see. What's that? Right. Yeah. Let me ask you a question real quick. Yeah. Everybody has a common thing as mm -hmm. a writer. Mm -hmm. Do you hear this stuff in your head uh, most of the time? Um. Sometimes, yeah. Um. It's. What's nice is that I get to play with what what they've written before. You know. So so a lot of times they develop the themes way before I'm on there. Because they're on site and they know a bit of what the story might be, right. I, get, I get so little information mm -hmm. because they keep their IP very, very protected, right? They, won't, they don't want anything to leak out. So, so they get little information. I get even less information. So they write themes based on that, and then I get to grab those themes and... and, and run with that. Yeah, which is really fun because, you know, once... It's interesting. It's happened a couple of times um, where I write something that's a variation of a theme that then they get back, and it's become vary to the point where it becomes sort of a new thing and then they use my thing on their thing, right? right? So it's a really interesting collaborative process. Yeah, I was thinking they call you cold jerky and say, hey, just come up with something. Sometimes, sometimes they're like, hey, so we have this thing, but you know, this is kind of what's happening in the world. Can you, you know, integrate it into that? And oh, it, cool. it is, it's super fun, yeah. Cause I'm like, ah, you know, I sit in front of this and it's blank and I go, I don't know what I'm doing. And, yeah. it, and even when I hit send, I'm like, oh, I really hope they like it. You know, it's imposter syndrome. It just, just never ends. Yes. When you're talking about sections, <laughs> you mean using the arranger track, right? No, this is, I don't, I've never used the arranger track. Uh, it's mostly just the cycle markers, so. Can you search them also? Uh, I can't remember if you can yeah. search them or not. the Project Logical Editor. Yeah, I suppose you can, yeah. Um, but for me, for me, this is mostly just a visual reference. It's like, okay, well, these are, you know, this is whatever, four bars or eight bars or whatever that is, and then I go on to the next eight bars, which... I try to make them different from the stuff before, and so what's what you know. Even though you have to sort of remain in a in a similar, in, you know, in the same key essentially, it allows me to do some really weird modulations that wouldn't that are unexpected, which is nice because you could do that. You can really get away with it as long as the transition is done properly. But you know, I can do like a minor chord to you know a, a minor a, a tritone apart, and it won't be weird. It's because right, right. I mean. We're, you're fighting aliens, so anything goes, you know. So, <laughs> yes. do you still uh, keep like kind of a linear development, like when you work in the cycle, like eight bars, uh, start really with a soft theme and then build on that, and just till the final boss fiddle in the end. I try to, yeah. So there's, um, uh, we've been trying to figure out how to do that, where, you know, where you get to a point in sort of the higher action stuff where. How, how do you loop a section so that if you're almost there as a player but you're not quite there, you can you can loop that section, you know, because it, it wouldn't make sense for you to kind of go back to a softer section if you're like just there, right? So we've been trying to figure figure that out. 
which has been an interesting thing. But yeah, it, it's um, I I, tru I I do try to to write it linearly, but I think of it you know it, it's you're you're thinking it well from your perspective from here to here, but also from here to here, right? So it's that's sort of an interesting thing about about games. Somebody else had a question, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it, it was long. What he said is that the, the, the game itself mm -hmm. is nonlinear, right? So to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, right. And so you you're used to writing, you scoring a film. Right. You know exactly what's going to happen mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. You're not so sure what's going to happen next in the game. So right. I was wondering how can you maybe unpack a little bit how your linear workflow turns into something that's more event based and more action based, and, and how do you keep all of that straight? From the beginning of the score to the end. Well, part of it is is the um, you know we have different sections of you know sort of more more ambient ambienty things. Uh, is this the beginning of it? Um, you know, so there's this kind of kind of stuff. So once you get to the you know to to the hard more hardcore uh, this stuff or you know even this kind of thing, like you're in the thick of it, like you're there's like stuff shooting at you and you're gonna die and, but you know when you're when you're here you're just kind of you know putzing around and oh what's this door ah let's go check out this door and so you can go into that door and then what do you deliver to them how much material do you deliver to, to the to the manufacturer to the gamer um if I can, sorry if I can ask that question yeah uh, very uh, frankly, do they give you the worst case scenario of a very terrible player? No. Scenario? Like, uh, what's the maximum this guy's going to start be stuck in level one? Uh, well, that's, I think, part of what they do within the game is, is that it plays one time through, and if nothing's happening, the music will stop for a bit. And then, you know, if there's some other thing, some other, some alien guy, you know, maybe, maybe that's how the console works, but it's like, you, look, you've been putzing around doing nothing. I'm just going to throw some, I'm going to throw an alien at you so that you can move your ass out of this level. So that's, I think that's part of, you know, of what the console will do. Um, so, you know, we deliver, you know, we deliver stems like you would in a film. Um, and so these are, whoops, all the stems that undo. Depends how much they need. Uh, yeah, so it depends on, you know, I, I, I can't remember how much I wrote for, it was, I, I just kept writing and saying, here you go, you want more? Yeah, okay, here you go. <laughs> so it, it, it's hard for me to give you a, an exact number. I don't know how much music is in the game. It's a lot because it's a really big game and they wanted to make sure that it was all varied and different and you didn't hear, oh, it's like, oh yeah, I've heard that one, that thing before. So interestingly enough, if I understood correctly, you're not involved with the actual implementation of the audio, so you just... <coughs> work your way through the basic composer side of things instead of uh, right. implementing things. So uh, how do you actually make a way or do you get kind of briefings how, how the audio needs to look like or how, how did you get a way around of getting to know the uh, overall uh, field, how to, how to have, I mean audio, game audio is very different than right. movie audio obviously. Yeah with all the loop stuff and it needs to be loopable and mm -hmm. needs to interact and as you said transition from one to another so um, do you do you get briefings from the game developer how they how they need the stuff done or there are, yeah there's definitely ways that I will deliver this is sort of a, a you know sort of an abridged version and some and some of it is I'm, I'm not sure how how much I can say how I deliver to them I, I, it sounds kind of you know kind of silly but um, but yeah it's 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 I deliver separate things to them enough that they're able to to use those sections, and then they are the ones that use the whole. And yeah, they they put it together, and that's I mean that's sort of like here you go, and that's all on you, you know. That's I mean, it's good to know that you can work in the game industry with, without being an expert in Atmod or W. Oh, for sure, or absolutely, yeah, definitely. Going uh, with what they were asking, mm -hmm. you find yourself giving a surplus of stuff that might not make the cut. I don't know. I don't know. I, I gave them. I give them what they asked me, and I I don't really know how much of it ends up in the game or not, um, because things are you know so delayed towards the end. I it's it's I I just have to sit down and play the game and go. Oh yeah, I remember that. So I don't know what ends ends up in the yeah. I don't know what ends up in the game or not. So you you get your entertainment attorney to work out. The yeah, exactly. Game, yeah. And then if it goes, then they just. Check will be in the mail. Yeah, I mean it's they say, oh, can you do this amount? Yeah, I can do that amount. Okay. So. Okay. It, other question I have, mm -hmm. your templates, mm -hmm. are they all the same? Do you have maybe, uh, when it comes to gaming, you might have 
five templates you might use or when it comes to writing other stuff. Most of the time I keep the same, the same one because it makes it easier for me to know where things fun. are. Yeah, so, you know, if, if I'm working on, on something that's not as bombastic and orchestral as this, I, would, I will strip it down. Okay. What's nice is that I can look for stuff so easily. I don't remember what the shortcut is for, you know, but I can go, you know, search and um, I guess you can do it manually and go, you know, violin. And it gives me the options of what the violin is. And, and part, of, part of building the template is I know, this is kind of silly, but when you have to do a really fast-paced thing, because I know my template so well, I know how many scrolls I need to do before I get to the percussion, to the snare drum or whatever. You know? So it's, all, it's really all about how, how fast I can get to the instrument. But the search thing makes it so much easier. And again, having worked on this other program, um, <laughs> searching for tracks and searching for, for plugins and things like that Cubase is just so, so far better than any other that I've used. Last question. Yeah. Typically, how long does it take for you to work on a project? About four hours, five hours? Uh, the answer is how long is a piece of string? <laughs> so it depends. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it really depends. Um, I mean, I've been working on this game for about two and a half years. So I started when they, they called me when they were going to release Destiny 2. Um, and I've been subsequently asked you know, back to do the... What I meant to say, typically, there's 24 hours in the day. Right. And you have your structure of the day. Right. And you say, okay, I'm going to wake up at 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. eat breakfast, and mm -hmm. I'll get in my room, and I'm going to work until noon. Then I'll yeah. have a break and go for a run, and then come back and maybe work. Yeah, there's hours. definitely that. You know, I, I, I wake up, I take my daughter to school, I go work out, and then I come back. So it's, so it's almost like I'm leaving, because I work from home. Going to the gym makes it seem like I'm, you know, going somewhere and then going back to my office, you know. So, so there's, the, you know, I try to keep that structure. I, I try not to, you know, work in my pajamas, you know, that kind of thing. I know it's, it might sound silly, but it puts me in a different headspace when I get dressed and I, oh, this is, this is work now, you know. So. You know, as an artist, you know, you think that, wow, I sound like me all the time. Right. right? And it's monotonous, so you yeah. want to sound want to throw a little element of surprise in there. Right. So you got to break it up, mix it up, mix yeah. your day up so it sounds different. And, you know, make sure you get out of your seat and leave. You know, there's been discussions with many composer friends like, oh, what chair, you know, what's the best chair for me to get? I'm like, <laughs> you just get up and move and exercise, you know? It's, uh, yeah. Yes. Last question for me because I've pretty much worked in the same way with all the stems and all that stuff. Uh, thing most interesting for me, how often do you actually really check the stems after export? Not often. Me neither. <laughs> I just often. wanted to be. Yeah, there. no, no so, so, you know, I was. I trust Cubase too. Yeah. So I mean, it out the way I want to. When I was working for, uh, for Steve, I would have to check them because it was, if there was something, it was terrible, right? So, um, but I've, I've, I've gotten to the point where, if there's something wrong, they can call me. But most of the time, there really isn't. I mean, it's it's really very reliable. I never had someone complain about the stems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the export has become so easy, and just as long as I set it up from the beginning, and I, you know, and I have my uh, F3 function, function F3. As long as I set this stuff up from from the beginning and everything's routed correctly, what I do sometimes forget is, I, you know, I'll call up a new instrument and I forget to route it and that's good it, or it was muted yeah um, so I you know I usually you know mute uh, I, I mute something so that if I go through this really quickly I can see if if everything's muted then then the routing is correct yes yeah 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 so because uh, you'll hear it in the two mix but if you don't if it's not going to the stems then that could be that could spell trouble yeah how do you actually uh, Talking about stems, have you set up individual reverbs, for example, for the individual stem groups, so you can include them in the render, or do you actually just don't need it because I it get re-recorded anyway? I do. So th th these are. It's funny because I, I set it up so long ago that I forget. <laughs> but these are my. So these are my. You know, general groups of you know percussion, high and mid, and uh, let me scroll over. There's stuff that's set up where I can just go, you know, send and send it to that. But um, so often I go, I, I do sort of like the silly thing of inserting a reverb into that channel rather than sending it mm -hmm. because it's so much easier. And I just play with the mix knob. Um, I was going to ask Greg if you could do a, a detailed uh, video about this uh, export using Ferris. On what particular topic? The export. Oh, the, you know, the export. STEM export. Yeah, I can show you some now if you'd like. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get more and more of my mixing back in Pro Tools and less of it in 
other mixing software. Please. So, or you can mix in Cubex. Yeah. Even better. Exactly. Even better. I want better. <laughs> better. That's, That's the point. answer. You'd be really happy then. I, yeah, I'm sure. So the best thing, you know, the the if you set up your project where you have your your, I guess what Cubase calls groups. Normally they're you know I guess in they're called buses in in the old school vernacular I suppose. Uh, function F3. And I'll try to zoom into this so you can see it. So these are all the stems that you know one might deliver for any any type of project. These are you know kind of standard, standard stems. So you, there's separation between you know long and short articulations on the you know woodwinds and the brass. I've taken some of them out because they're oh I guess this one has all of them. You know choirs, harps, temp, you know, timpani, then you know all kinds of percussion stuff. And so once you go into your audio export, all, all of these basically. So so you have you know your Brass going to the brass group, so there might be however many tracks of brass going into the brass group, and then at, all of that goes out ultimately into your stereo, as in any other. I don't know where it went, but it's it's there somewhere. Um, what's nice about this export window is that it has just a ton of options. So I can export simply just the just the two mix, just my stereo mix. If I go into export multiple channels, here are all my groups. So I can select all of my groups, and then this will spit out basically what is back here, all of these things. So it'll spit out the brass separately from the woodwinds, from the strings, from the synths, from all that. And what's also nice is that if I set up, you know, I have these different markers here, I can say, oh, this is, you know, Whatever it might be, say if it's a pop song, this is the chorus, this or this is the intro, this is the verse, this is the chorus, and this is the outro. You can also export by that. So you can go to between cycle markers, and it'll export just the intro, just the chorus, just the verse. Um, so that is all really handy. And not only that, it'll when you when you set up your naming correctly, which you can do uh, file naming scheme, you can set up how you want things to be named, so that it says, oh, piano, uh, verse one. Uh, and then some kind of a maybe a date or a number or and it's all done once you set that up you click and everything's exported and it might either go to some other folder it, you might import it straight into this project itself which I usually do or it'll export into a new project all with that window yeah I used to do that yeah I used to I used to have a separate um, Print machine with with uh, another software software that runs with uh, slow stools, and everything would go into that, and everything is just so much quicker doing it within here. You know, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Yes. Uh, what's the process when you have to record uh, the real orchestra going from QAs to sheet music? So when I send stuff to the orchestrator, we have a wonderful orchestrator. Who we also went to Berkeley with. He's a really great guitar player. He went on tour. He's he sort of runs the gamut of the different genres of music. He went on tour with uh, Jay Z, and you know, and now he's doing. You know, he's really a student of uh, Ravel, and he loves all this stuff. So I usually get rid of all the things that are not orchestra related. So that's where the macros come in. Somebody asked me about a macro. So I go delete, you know, stuff that's named this, or delete empty, and it just gets rid of all the empty stuff and all the muted things, all the muted notes, all the muted elements. And you end up with only the orchestra. So, so all these different things here. And it, you know, if it's empty, like this, whatever that articulation might be, it, it, it won't show up in this session. A lot of people like to work with key switches or with uh, expression uh, maps and all that. I, I, I tried it. I tried all the different variations and I fi found that it's easier for me to have a different MIDI track for a different articulation. So that's why you'll see, you know, solo legato and then there's, you know, uh, long and short and staccato. Um, it just seems easier for me to look at it that way than trying to figure out um, key switching and it e makes it easier for the orchestrator as well because if you look at the MIDI and you don't really see, you know, there's some note down here. Yeah, he might know that it's a key switch, but it's like, well, what is that key switch for? Yeah. I mean, he does have an MP3, but yeah. 
but it's it just makes things a lot easier for not for there to not be any extra information. If the information is not useful to him, it shouldn't be there. So, to get back to your question, all the orchestral elements go to him. He gets uh, a an MP3 of the entire thing. He gets an MP3 separately for each articulation, so brass long, brass uh, short, uh, uh, woodwinds long, short, and same with the strings. And he puts it on paper, and then we have a conversation of, you know, should we do this? Should I do that? Usually I go, yeah, that sounds great, because I, I trust his work. Um, and usually he's got a lot better ideas of what we could do that I didn't think of, because maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't have that sample. I know it sounds silly, but a lot of times we're, we're so... Uh, focused on what the sample is doing or what sound is, you know, is there that we don't think, oh, you know, an entire string section could do this one thing. So that's where he comes in and he goes, oh, that, that, that works really well. And not only that, he's also a check for, for me where he goes, why do you have a low C on the violins? I don't, but, you know, it's, it's really good to have somebody there because the last thing I want is when I'm in front of the orchestra <laughs> is for the orchestra to go, oh, God, then, you know, you can't play this, right? So... So it goes to him, he sends it back for, for us to proofread, and then we go to Nashville, um, and we record there. I grab the files from, from their servers, and I mix, I usually mute all of the orchestral elements that we recorded and just have the live stuff. Um, I don't think I have it in this session, but yeah, usually all this stuff just goes away. Um, Anything that says orchestra will go away, and then this is all then filled with um, however many live tracks. And then I, I, once it gets there, because I've you know pre-mixed everything as I'm writing, there there isn't that much work for me to do afterward. Maybe I'll go through and figure out which takes might be better than others, but it's usually pretty pretty quick after I get it and put it in, just to make sure that everything lines up. If I need some more oomph and a bit more weight, I will combine some of the samples with the orchestra. Um, but that's the gist of how, how that process goes. Do you just export the recordings that you get as is and get mixed somewhere out there? Or I mix it. I mix it, yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you happen to have a consistency if you've got like, four different guys working on it? Do you kind of uh, talk with each other? <laughs> it's funny. I, I, don't, I don't know how that happened. A lot of it is because of Sky. Um, you know, he... You know, there was you know, four of us, and, and then the album came out, and, and you know, we were like, how, this sounds like it all came from one room. And it, it was really, really surprising and, and, and really nice to, to get to that point. Um, it helps that we have the same lead orchestrator. It helps that we record in the same room. Um, so that's a big part of it. And, but yeah, we all have, you know, we all have our, our different, different sound, but it all, it's all very cohesive. I don't know how that happened. I guess, you know, I don't know, one of those things... Yeah, yeah, it's the, one of those magical things that just happens. Yeah. I'm assuming this is connected to your slave machine for VE Pro. I have one slave with percussion, and that's it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what I am the guy in the transition of the other software. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, From I, Schmagic? I, yeah. Absolutely. And <laughs> I have gone through pain uh, when it comes to ports and... V Pro yeah. because the, the amount of limitation for an orchestral composer, uh, which is what I found, which Dirk has been very kind to for the transferring, is that how do you find V Pro and all that kind of stuff integrated with your Cubase? Is that like it's super easy? It's yeah. so easy. Yeah, it really is. There's no porting and all that. Kind of no, things. no. That's the reason why I switched from Logic. Cubase because of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this the, this thing you know that's also this makes it easy. Uh, this, obviously, there's no VE Pro in here, but that's why the rack is so so much easier with 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 the other program. There's a lot more. It's a lot more convoluted the way that you route things. With this, you click a button, it gives you a new output, a new MIDI track. It's really super super easy. Cool. So you set right. your stuff up in in the cloud. You trusted in the cloud? What's well, their cloud? Their cloud in Seattle. Oh, their cloud. Okay. Yeah. So they have yeah. Lots of yeah. They do. They have lots of clouds, and <laughs> yeah, they they all they they're guarded by you know sentinels, and oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, I just have my main machine that has you know a bunch of RAM, and then separately I have a slave. Eventually that'll go away. Um, but I try to keep it as as streamlined and as simple as I can. It's good work. Like what I heard. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer. 
do you have a mobile rig that you work with when you're traveling at all, or do you work? I like just I just bought a laptop, so I, I went to to Germany to speak in September, and I was in the middle of a project, and I didn't have a laptop, so I went and bought one, and I did some work remote, remotely, but this stuff, um, I haven't done any of this stuff remotely. Um, it, that's what I've been thinking about next, is how do I pare all of this stuff down into, you know, 30 gigs or less of samples, although a lot of stuff you can stream now from from uh, from the drive, so it shouldn't be that much of an issue. I'm just so used to the way that things are laid out on my actual desk that I haven't, you know, I have to kind of break away from that. But I do have one. I haven't really tested it fully yet. Right, well, thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.